Uh, I want to introduce our speaker tonight. This is uh, Bruce McFadden. Um, he's a distinguished um, professor of paleontology at the Florida Museum uh, at the University of Florida. He has been on the faculty since 1977, and his specialty has included studies of fossil horses. And he wrote a book on this topic. Um, he is an author of more than 200 scientific publications and has been the president of both the Paleontological so excuse me, Society and so Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. I can't read tonight. <laughs> he received his bachelor's degree from Cornell University and master's and PhD from Columbia University. Uh, and I'll let Bruce take it away and um, welcome back. Thank you very much. I'm interested in how did you find, uh, you invited me to give this talk, I don't know, six months ago. I'm just interesting, how to, interested, how did you find my name? Um, actually, the curator before me yeah. was, was interested in paleontology and ran across your book on the, um, the horses out at Optima. Interesting. Okay, good. Yeah. I'll talk more about sort of my journey. And I actually almost did my doctoral dissertation on the horses from Optima. Uh, that's a whole nother story. And I've, I've always wanted to see them. And I was hoping that I could possibly come out and give you a presentation in person. But of course, that wasn't meant to be. So I guess we're, we're fortunate for having Zoom. So let me just a second here. All right, so I wanna talk a little bit about who I am, my background, and I wanna talk about prehistoric horses in North America and some misconceptions that, that the general public has about uh, fossil horses, prehistoric horses. I wanna talk about the Works Progress Administration, the WPA during the depression, the Dust Bowl, and collecting fossils from the Oklahoma Panhandle and also in uh, the Texas Panhandle adjacent to you all. And then some work about, actually, um, you may or may not know this, but the optimal horses are very important in understanding the, the overall evolutionary sequence of horses from, it, for, from all of North America. And you should feel a sense of pride, in my opinion, that the horses were collected in your backyard, so to speak. Um, have any of you been to the, uh, the old Optima uh, fossil quarries back from the W in the 1930s? Anybody? Anybody know about them or have you ever been there? No? No. And how how far is is are the how far is the Optima ranch or the Optima from where you are now? 10 miles. Okay. So, it's where you live. Yeah. <laughs> you talking about the town of Optima or after the town? Excuse me? Or after the town of Optima are you referenced? I don't I don't know exactly, but there are some fossil quarries at the town near the town of Optima. I've never been there, so I don't know exactly where there are they are. Uh, I was hoping that maybe somebody in the audience would know more about it. I'm just curious. I mean, I could go into the no. in the archives of the museums like in Oklahoma and California and the and New York and find the field records of where they found exactly the fossils from Optima. So I don't really know. But where, uh, uh, Optima was on the river. It moved up when the railroad came through originally. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, and then I want to talk about the kinds of horses that were discovered at Optima and why they're important to understand something about the origins of prairie grasslands in prehistoric times in, in the, the Southern Great Plains where you are. And then some just final thoughts, closing remarks. And I, I'm hoping to speak for about a half an hour or so, and then we could have time for questions. So that's, that's my outline for tonight. Uh, my background is I grew up in suburban New York, Westchester County, and as a kid, I used to go as my, my mom used to take me to the American Museum of Natural History in New York, which is one of the great natural history museums in the world. And they have a spectacular collection of fossil horses in the American Museum of Natural History. And the, uh, so this is, can you see my cursor when I move it on the screen? 
Yes. yes. Good. Yeah, so this is the outer facade of the American Museum of Natural History. And coincidentally, it was when they had a, a, um, a temporary exhibition called The Horse that they produced at the American Museum. And one of their dioramas depicts the kinds of horses that live throughout North America at the same time as Optum. And I'll show you one of those, those dioramas in just a few minutes. I was a graduate student at Columbia University, but my my major professor was um, a, a curator at the American Museum of Natural History. And he hooked me up when I was a graduate student with a, a, a fossil collector who during the depression, the, he, was a, um, he was a farmer and rancher from Nebraska and collected fossils all over North America during the depression um, in order to make ends meet. And he collected, these. this is an array through time. This, his name was Morris Skinner. And he was sort of my hero, my mentor when I was a graduate student at Columbia and in the American Museum. And he was the world's authority on fossil horses at the time. And this large table, which he used to call, call the horse table, starts with the oldest horses from North America back here at about 50 million years ago. And it ends up with the kinds of fossil horses that we find during the ice ages throughout all of North America until they became extinct about 10,000 years ago. So this is almost 50, this is an array of almost 50 years of the evolutionary tree of horses from North America. And to give you an example of where the Gaiman, op, the Optima Gaiman horses, which is what they're referred to in the literature, um, this, this, this yellow arrow is where is the time zone from about five to six million years ago when we find the Gaiman horses. So actually some of these horses right here in this zone right here are likely from Gaiman and then others are from some other fossil localities in Hemp Hill County, Texas in the Texas Panhandle. So um, your horses, so to speak, are in this evolutionary array. And in fact, Morris Skinner and his, his associates some with WPA money from the 1930s collected fossil horses from Optima Gaiman. So that's the, that's the background of, of, um, of the, the, horse, the horse tree and where your horses, prehistoric horses fit into this 50 million year evolutionary tree, yours fit in at about 5 million years ago right here. Each one of these segments is a timeline of about five million years going back into the past, back up to 50 million years back here. And as I said, the Ice Age horses are here. Okay, so how do I get involved in fossil horses? Well, I got in, involved in fossil horses because as a graduate student, uh, Morris Skinner took me under his wing and taught me what he knew uh, about fossil horses. And then he retired, he was in his 60s when I was a graduate student there in New York in the 70s, 1970s. And he taught me what he thought I should know about fossil horses. And that uh, generated a lifelong interest in me as a paleontologist studying the, the history of horses, the prehistoric history of horses. And as, as you said in the introduction, I actually wrote a book on fossil horses that was published in 1992. And I've also been a museum scientist where I've developed fossil exhibits on horses and their, their ancestors. And this actually is an Ice Age horse skeleton that's on display in our museum at the Florida Museum of Natural History in Gainesville, Florida, where I teach at the University of Florida. Um, in the past decade, I've gotten very interested in working with school teachers uh, throughout the United States in using fossil horses as evidence for evolution and, 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 and ancient and prehistoric life. And about 10 years ago, I, did, I had a training, a weekend train, a week long training session in, in a summer institute at our university where I was working with about a dozen teachers and they were developing lesson plans using some of the fossil horse teeth that we had in our museum. We have fossil horses in our museum in Florida that are also about five to 6 million years old. And they're similar to the uh, horse, they're from Florida, but we know that these horses existed throughout North America during this time. We find them in Florida, in, in, in Oklahoma. We find them in Texas. We find them in, in um, Nebraska. Um, 
New Mexico, where I also do field work, and also all the way into California. And even some of these horses, like some of the horses that you have in Optimagaiman, also got into Mexico, into Central America. So that's sort of my journey as a scientist as it relates to fossil horses and my more recent interest in working with school teachers to make sure that they, they understand how fossil horses can be used to teach kids about science. And that's something I feel very passionately about um, now as um, sort of in this stage of my career. Any questions? Please feel free to ask questions if you want. Um, don't see anybody raising their hand, so I'll continue. So why do I study fossil horses? Well, I study fossil horses because if I told you that I study um, some other kind of, okay, if I told you I studied dinosaurs, that would be good as well. But if I told you I studied some other kind of extinct mammals that have no modern analog, I'd have to convince you that those, those, kinds, of, those kinds of animals like say calicotheres or brontotheres, that, which you may or may not know what they are, but I'd have to spend five or 10 minutes convincing you that they're worth your attention. If, when I give public talks and I give a lot of lectures like this, when I, when I say, okay, I study fossil horses, typically people are generally interested in horses. So they're, they're said to be a charismatic or model kind of animal to study in the past and because people like them, okay? The other thing is that they're widely distributed and abundant geographically, but also through time over the past 55 or 50 million years ago, in North America and also in the old world as well. They evolve rapidly and they're a classic textbook and museum example of evolution. This is an example of collecting fossils in Florida in, the, in, in this photograph down here. This is from about 40 years ago where we were collecting 1.5 million year old ice age fossils from Florida. And each one of these, this is a shell pit and each one of these black specks is a ice age mammal uh, that was petrified, prehistoric mammals, and a large percentage of these bones, can you see my cursor moving on that photograph? Yes. yes. Good. A large percentage of the bones in this quarry represent uh, fossil horses. Okay. The modern horse family consists of about eight to 10 different kinds of varieties or species, including the domesticated horse. Um, a horse that probably was, actually, yeah, these are domesticated <clears throat> horses up here. These are ancient pre, uh, domesticated horses called the Przewalski horses. Some other, some other um, donkey-like animals. This is called an, a, uh, an asinine. And then two, uh, several different types of zebras. And all these types of animals comprise the, fa the, the family of horses that are comfortably put within the scientific name of the genus Equus. And so there are about eight to 10 species of modern horses that descended from the fossil horses. But as a paleontologist, what I know is over the past 50 million years, in addition to the 10 modern horse species, there've been more than 200 extinct species sources of horses described by paleontologists over the past 125 years, spanning from the 55 million year old dawn horse, what used to be called Heracotherium, to other kinds of horses like we find in Florida that are 18 million years old, to the kinds of horses that have been discovered from Optima Gaiman. Um, horse, we know based on archeological evidence that horses were not originally domesticated in North America. They were originally domesticated likely in the, in the, uh, the dry grasslands of, of Eastern Eurasia on the so-called Mongolian steppes based on the, the radiocarbon dating of horse skeletons from archeological sites. And this is a beautiful example of that you could, this, this is the skull and jaws and the skeleton of a horse that lived, uh, was probably domesticated and lived uh, alongside humans about 7,000 years ago in places like Mongolia. Uh, the Przewalski's horse, which, which is found today it's a primitive breed, but it is pretty close to the ancestral stock that was originally wild, but then became domesticated, as I said, about six to 8,000 years ago. <clears throat> the family tree of horses um, uh, covers the past 55 million years, as I said. It is a branching tree of different scientific names, and some of the horses 
fed mostly on, on, on leafy vegetation, like you can see the, what are called the browsers here. And then many of the horses that lived about 5 million years ago, like the horses that you find at Optimagaimon, fed mostly on grass and they're called grazers. And I can tell you based on the shape of the teeth, why we think that horses from Optimagaimon were grazers and fed in the ancient prairie grasslands of your area. Okay, I'm just taking my watch off to check my time. All right, so horses in North America, the public generally thinks, if you ask the person on the street, when did horses come to North America? Well, most people would say, well, yeah, I know that. Horses were introduced to the Americas by the Spanish explorers about 500 years ago. But if I, when I give talks and I say, yeah, that's only the tip of the iceberg, that's the historical times, but horses lived in North America for 50 million years until they became extinct about 10,000 years ago. And the modern horse originated about four and a half million years ago in North America. People are flabbergasted. They, they never realized that that happened. But indeed, that's the case. So we know that based on the fossil evidence of, of horses throughout North America from, men, from hundreds, if not thousands of fossil localities throughout all of North America, and that array of horses that I showed you in the second slide from uh, Mr. Uh, Morris Skinner's horse table at the American Museum of Natural History, that where I learned about fossil horses is direct fossil evidence of the antiquity of horses in the United States and North America because all the horses on that horse table were from various localities in North America. Okay, I wanna now, that's a general introduction to my background and a stud and, and what horses are related to, how many horse species there are today, how many fossil horses species there were. Now I wanna talk to you about a fascinating history of collecting fossils during the the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. And I've read that book um, about um, was the worst hard times about the Dust Bowl and how it affected your area. And I'm, I, I'm, a, so I'm, I'm a historian of science. I love to talk about prehistoric animals, but I'm also fascinated in human history. And I thought that book by, I think the, the author is Tom Egan um, uh, about the Dust Bowl was fascinating. And I remember Morris Skinner telling, telling me stories about when he was a boy in the 1930s collecting, collecting fossils from the Dust Bowl of Nebraska. It was really a tough existence. And I'm sure that many of your ancestors have, have passed stories down to you about what the Dust Bowl was like during the depression in the, in the, in the 30s in, in your area as well. Well, as most of you know, the government subsidize a workforce called the WPA, the Work Progress Administration, who was supposed to help build buildings and other do, do other public projects. And one, one arm or one, one, one type of program that the Works Progress Associ uh, Administration funded, in addition to roads and bridges and other infrastructure was the collecting of fossils from important sites around North America, and in particular, sites from the, the central, from the area that you're in and adjacent Texas. And this, these are actually, um, I guess these are scientists or uh, workers for the WPA workers in the 1930s collecting a giant limb bone, likely of a fossil elephant. I don't know exactly where it's from, but it may be from your area, I'm not sure. And then I think this, this may actually be this, photograph in the right in the right which you can see there's a sign up here at advertising the USA works progress uh, uh, the WPA program so presumably it's branding the collecting of fossils from this area right here and I actually think this may be the Gaiman optimal locality I'm not sure and I was hoping if somebody in the audience knew for a fact where the, what the quarries look like we might be able to know this but I think from my search on an internet this actually may be the what the quarries look like that they were excavating there were apparently several levels and they were chock full of different mammals all of which were about five to six million years old and many of them that predominated were of fossil horses. Okay, 
Um, there was a paleontologist who worked in Canyon. Have any of you been to the, the museum in Canyon, Texas, south of Amarillo? It's about two and a half hours, two, two, two hours and 15 minutes from you all. Have any of you been to the Panhandle Plains Museum? Yes. Yeah, I think it's a fabulous museum. I've actually studied the fossils from that museum. And those were collected from uh, not just areas in Texas, but also uh, areas of, in Oklahoma from Optima Gaiman. And um, C. Stewart Johnson depicted in the upper photograph in the, in the right, and his wife, Margaret, um, uh, led teams of WPA ki uh, workers, young men, to help them collect fossils from, uh, from um, the general area of the Texas and Oklahoma panhandle. C. Stewart Johnson was, a, was an instructor at West, West Texas State Normal College at the time, or Teachers College. It's now, I think, called West Texas A&M. When I used to go there looking at studying the fossils in the museum, it was called West Texas State University. That's a fabulous little museum. They have a horse display and downstairs behind the scenes, you can go down. And I, I studied a lot of the fossil horses in that museum. And it's um, a place that I always, I've been back to probably a half dozen times in my 40 year career studying fossil horses. And it's, it's, it's a go-to place for me to understand the kinds of horses that lived in the, the panhandles about five to six million years ago. And, and the, the archives, the history of C. Stewart Johnson, who was very charismatic and his wife are chronicled in the history of science. And you can also see that it's on this Texas Historical Commission. In addition to being a, teach, a, a, a professor and instructor at the West Texas Normal School at the time, he and his wife supervised WPA fossil collecting. And then he, was he was in the, at the same time pursuing Oklahoma pursuing his doctoral degree in paleontology um, at the University of Oklahoma, but suddenly and mysteriously he died when he was on a research trip to the Harvard Museum in as you can see here in 1939. So there's very interesting local history about fossil collecting and paleontology in your neck of the woods. Okay. Any any I, any questions or comments? I hear someone. You want to you want to make any comments? What was the size of that horse? How big the was? It? Yeah, we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. I'll I'll focus in on the size of the horse in just a few minutes. Okay. Um, but you being a historical society, I thought I'd give a little bit more history than I might give to a you know to another kind <coughs> of audience. Because A, I'm fascinated in it, and B, I, I've, I've read some about it, particularly as it relates to the West Texas, the Panhandle Plains Museum, which is affiliated with the, the, univer the, the university and college at, at Canyon. But now I want to focus on the history of collecting fossil horses in the Oklahoma Panhandle. And the collections that were made, and actually there was an article published in, in 2019 about depression, about WPA. I, I can't remember where I, I did a web search and you could also do a search if you wanted, but they, that these, these workers, um, the, the, the fossils from the Oklahoma and Texas panhandles um, demonstrated a kind of life that lived in, in this area back five to six million years ago that is, has been said to be similar to the modern grasslands of the Serengeti uh, grasslands of of East Africa, and they called it the Serengeti, Texas Serengeti. And here, to, here is an artist reconstruction of what life looked like in your area. Let's see, it says actually in Beeville, Texas, um, 12 million years ago, but this could just as well be 6 million years ago in a, the Amarillo Canyon area or also Optima Gairn. So the collections in your area were made with the help of the WPA from Optima. They were shipped from Gaiman, as I understand it. And these collections at the time were, were, uh, were made from and can be now found at uh, several different museums in Oklahoma. I should also mention the Panhandle Plains of Texas, although it's a smaller collection. There is a large museum of paleontology in California, and then the American Museum of Natural History, where I studied when I was a graduate student in the 1970s. So the, the, so they're, they're also, yeah, so their collections in Norman, 
huge collections from WPA and Norman. And they were, when I went out uh, to the University of Oklahoma in the 80s to study those collections, they were an old, they were in old army barracks, wooden army barracks from the 1930s. And they were dusty and they were not well taken care of, but they've since, if many of you, um, I guess that some of you have likely been to Norman to the Natural History Museum there. And, and what they've done is they've put these, to, they've, they've, they've gotten rid of the WPA um, uh, bar wooden barracks buildings and they've built a beautiful new museum. And the, the fossil horse is collected from Optum and Gaiman. In fact, it's probably the large, it should be the largest collection of fossils from that area are in, in the research collections at the University of Oklahoma and some of the skeletons have been reconstructed on display um, at that institution. There are no skeletons on display in California that I know of uh, at the University of California, Berkeley. All the collections from Optima Gaiman are in their back behind the scenes in the research collections. And I think that's also the same at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Interestingly, Interestingly, of the thousands of fossil uh, fossil mammals that were collected from Optima Gaiman, for some reason, more than 80% of them are extinct horses. So they were a major uh, a major um, player in the, the 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 ancient Serengeti of the Texas and Oklahoma Panhandle during that time. So there have been a couple of papers published on the Optima Gaiman uh, quarries. And the one, the go-to one when I was a graduate student was by Donald Savage, who was a professor of paleontology at Berkeley, but he was an Oklahoman. And he got his, uh, his undergraduate degree at the University of Oklahoma and then went off to the war. He was in the Army Air Force, as was my father. And then he came back, got his PhD at Berkeley and then stayed on as a professor at Berkeley from, uh, from the time he got back from the 50s to the time he retired and I think in the late 80s. But in 1941, so right after WAPA finished at the beginning of uh, the first, the second world war, excuse me, he described some really interesting carnivorous mammals that, that were collected as you can see that they were collected by WPA labor under the sponsorship of the University of Oklahoma in 1937 and 1938. So that's the end of the great depression. And, um, his connection, because of his, his background being from the University of Oklahoma, I guess he took an interest in the Optima fauna, the Optima animals, and described the fossils that were in various collections, including the University of Oklahoma, University of California, and the American Museum of Natural History, the Frick Laboratories, which, is, uh, which were the laboratories that my mentor, Maura Skinner, was affiliated with. Thankfully, when I was doing research for this talk, and by the way, I've never been to the Optima Gaiman quarries. When I was a graduate student, I was working in New Mexico, um, north of Santa Fe on a different project. And I remember driving straight through back. It was like 33 hours from New Mexico. And I drove through Gaiman. And I knew about the horses because I almost uh, did my doctoral dissertation on the horses from this fauna. But my major professor had money for me to do another project, which I actually ultimately did for my dissertation. So I've never been to the Optima Gaiman quarries. But when you ask me to give this talk, it sort of it has a place in my heart because I, the fossils in the collections, when you pull the drawers, the skulls and the skeletons of the American Museum, they're just spectacular. I was interested in studying the population structure. How many, how you can actually tell whether a fossil horse is a male or a female, a juvenile or an adult or a senior citizen. And I wanted to understand how did these animals all, why did they, why did 80%, why are 80% of the Optima Gaiman horses, uh, uh, fauna or fossils horses? And what could we, there are literally thousands of these fossils in these museums. And what could we tell about the ancient herds? The structure, the age structure, and the 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 sex the the sex ratios in these herds um, that lived five to six million years ago it was fascinating. But thankfully, this year, an article was recently published by J. Fredrickson, and frankly, I don't know him. This is uh, I know a couple of the let's see, I know Nick Chaplewski, who is a collections manager and curator of paleontology at the University of Oklahoma, really good guy. Um, but I honestly don't, this is probably the next generation of paleontologists. 
I'm getting up in years and these people are probably new to the scene, but they actually have a very nice paper. And this is what's called open access. You could actually, if you wanted to read this, it's, it's science and it's technical, but if you wanted to just get a sense from it, you could, you could do a Google search on this and you could find it and then you could download it from the web and you could read it. It's about, a, let's see, it's a, about a 17 page paper and it's really a good background on the Optima Gaiman or what's called the Optima Local Fauna from, from your area. So the context, if uh, the context of what the sediments look like that included the Optima horses are from a, a large swath of Miocene, which is five to six million year old sediments called the Ogallala beds. And these Ogallala beds are these windblown and river sorted sands that you can see, sands and, and, and silts, ancient rivers and, and streams. And they, they uh, were conducive to the deposition of fossil, of skeletons of fossil horses and other animals that lived during the time that then became uh, part of this, um, the fossil locality that we've been talking about. So that's what the fossil localities look like uh, from the Ogallala beds. And the Ogallala beds are not just found in the panhandle of o Texas and Oklahoma, but they extend northward into Kansas and Nebraska. And my, my mentor, Morris Skinner, collected similar, they're all of the same age. Okay, this, this was a, an ancient stream and river system in the central part of the United States, the ancient central part of the United States. And this river system preserved animals that all lived at the same time, whether it be from Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, or some in Eastern New Mexico as well, and also Colorado and Wyoming and South Dakota, as you can see. So the age of the Optima horses, if you look at a geologic time scale going back to the age of the earth billions of years ago, we get dinosaurs that lived, if you look at my cursor here, during what was called the middle life or Mesozoic. So Optima is about five to six million years old where this blue arrow is. It's called, a, a paleontologists and geologists call, it's, call this the Miocene epoch of geologic time. The horses lived after the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs became extinct about 65 million years ago at the end of the what's called Cretaceous era. And then horses first got started, uh, first evolved uh, in the Northern hemisphere at about 55 million years ago. And the family tree of horses that I've shown you in previous slides and that was arrayed on the table, uh, uh, the horse table with Morris Skinner, um, span the, 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 what's called the Eocene to the modern or the Holocene, but the horses from Optima are the late Miocene right here. So that's the age, the geologic context I just showed you in the last slide. Let's see what the next slide has. Ah, okay. So there are, of the thousands of, of fossil bones and skulls and jaws of horses from Optima, there are four kinds of horses represented. And they're not just a single kind of horse, they're four different kinds of horses. And their scientists give them the name, it really doesn't matter, uh, but basically the names are of Nanippus, Neohipparian, Astrohippus, and Dinohippus. Um, and some of them were three-toed like Nanippus, and Neohipparian had extra side toes, if you can see my cursor right here. These were three-toed horses, and these Astrohippus and Dinohippus were, were one-toed horses like the modern-day horse. And actually, scientists believe, or scientists based on evidence, um, uh, posit mm -hmm. or, or basically assert that Dinohippus mexicanus, known from Optima and other places from Miocene horse localities in North America, it is the direct ancestor of the modern day equus that evolved, first evolved about four and a half million years ago. So we have these horses as six million year, five to six million years ago at Optima. And then they gave rise, uh, Dinohippus gave rise to the modern day horse genus equus four and a half million years ago. And the other horses, Astrohippus, Nanippus, and Neohipparian all became extinct after this time. So the first question you're going to ask me is how big are these horses? And the 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 dinohippus, dinohippus means gigantic horse or ferocious horse, like dinosaur, gigantic or a terrible horse, terrible lizard, 
dino, dinosaurs, dino hippus, it's all the same uh, uh, root of the word. Dino hippus mexicanus was first found in Mexico, hence the name, but it, it, that species existed throughout the entire Ogallala sediments and other sediments. It, I, we even find it in the phosphate mines in, in Florida. It was about the size of a modern day zebra, okay? The other horses were smaller, and the, the, uh, on the other size range of the smallest horses of the four kinds that are found at Optima Gaiman, the smaller horse was about the size of a modern day pronghorn. So there was a considerable variation in the overall size of the horses from Optima Gaiman, the four different species that go from as large as a zebra to as small as a, as a, a pronghorn. The other question we, so we wanna know who was there how big they were, and what did they do for their living, or what they do for a living, their ecology. How did they adapt to the ancient habitats that existed in what's now Oklahoma five to six million years ago? So what we study is we study uh, within fossil horses, we study the shape of the teeth. And what we know is that horses and other kinds of animals that live primarily in forests uh, this happens to be a taper that lives in the forest, the tropical forest of, of the New World tropic, uh, the tropical forest of the New World today. When animals live in forests, they feed on soft vegetation or fruits and nuts, and they have a tooth that has a relatively small enamel. So we have the same kind of teeth as a tooth like this. We have a large rat root, a large root, and then a small enamel cap on our tooth. Animals like this are said to be browsers, including ourselves. We're actually omnivores, but we have a, dent a dentition like uh, animals that feed on softer vegetation. In contrast, animals like modern zebras, they feed on grasses in the savanna grasslands, for example, of East Africa. And those grasses are really abrasive. They actually have little sand particles inside the grass, the grass blades themselves, which tend to wear down the teeth of, of horses and other animals that feed on grasses, and those are grazers. So through the course of evolution, horses have adapted uh, to having larger, longer, longer crown, longer enamel teeth in order to combat, in order to feed on very abrasive uh, food resources like you find in prairie grasslands. To give you an example of comparison, the root of this tooth is this, is this part right here. And the root of this part, this tooth right here, this so-called high crown tooth is just right here. So this is the root of a horse of a great, excuse me, this is the root of a mammal that feeds on abrasive grasses. It's a grazer. This is its root and this is its crown. Contrast that to the large root of an animal like a taper that has a long root and a relatively short crown. It does not feed on grass. If it did, it would wear its teeth down um, very rapidly because as I said, basically if you're feeding on grass, your, your teeth are, are, are eating sandpaper. Uh, the grasses are so abrasive. So if you look at the shape of the teeth at the Gaiman horses, they all were feeding on similar kinds of food. Which ones do you think they were feeding on? Were they living in forests or feeding on grasslands? Grasslands. Correct. So if horses, were, if horses that we find from Optima Gaiman were feeding on grasslands, based on what we know of the the shape of teeth that of animals that feed on grasses using modern analogs like zebras. The horses from Optima Gaiman would have had very elongated teeth. You can see here, it's this is actually a tooth. If it's not from Optima Gaiman, it's from the canyon locality, but it doesn't, I don't remember exactly which one, but this is a very, very, what's called high crown tooth. Its root is right here, just like the root that you see here. And all four of the diff all four of the species of horses that lived at Optima and have been found as fossils in Optima have very elongated teeth, meaning that they all fed on grasses and that the predominant habitat 
in Optima Gaiman during this time was grasslands. Okay, there's a diorama, the, the horse exhibit from the American Museum that I told you uh, was on display when I showed you in my first slide during my talk, um, that there's a diorama from the horses. What did the horses look like fleshed out in, in, in the Miocene about five to six million years ago? Well, this actually is right here, an example of a diorama of what the horses look like at localities like Optima and, uh, and other localities of similar age. But there were other animals that also lived. You know, the other 20% of the animals found in Optima were some other strange contemporaneous animals that lived alongside the horses. One of them was a, was a giant amphibious rhinoceros. So right, in addition to horses living in North America during that time, rhinoceroses also lived in Flor hey, Florida. Rhinoceroses also lived in Texas and Oklahoma at this time, as did giant camels and also the ancestors of elephants. And those elephants had very flat and lower tusks, as you can see here, which probably was used to, sh to scoop up vegetation. All these animals were herbivores or plant eaters that lived alongside the horses in, in Optima. The rhinoceros also had high, high, had high crown teeth, though it's, it too was feeding on the grasses, perhaps grasses that were living closer to the rivers. But the camels have very short crown teeth, like the tapers. So it, it was one of the exceptions to the rules in the ancient ecosystems from your area, and it was feeding on on uh, probably uh, leafy vegetation the way modern camels do today. And then you have the, 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 the elephant here, the, the, what's called the gomphotere elephant. And then something had, to been e something had to have been eating the herbivores in the ecosystem. That's the, just the, the chain of life and the top of the ecosystems. And, and uh, Dr. Savage wrote about some of the smaller, um, some of the, the carnivores from Optima Kaiman, but there also was a, a giant bear called Agriotherium that also used to live in this ancient ecosystem during this time. So this was a fascinating um, assemblage of animals that gives us a window of what life was like in the past, including the objects of sort of my interest, the, the ancient horses. And if you put them all together into a reconstruction of what, was, what, did, what did Optima look like five, million year, five to six million years ago, and other areas of the Ogallala sedimentary regime that I showed you that extend all the way from, from Oklahoma and Texas up to you know, South Dakota, this is a good reconstruction of the kinds of animals that used to live in this area during the Miocene. Okay, so my final thoughts uh, for my presentation are the Optima horses are fundamentally important to an understanding of the prehistory of your region. They also give us a window into the under understanding of what's the antiquity, how long have grasslands been around in your area? We know based on their teeth, that there were extensive grasslands six, five to six million years ago. And that's what was the primary food resource for the four different species, of the horses that lived in your area. This is a significant site to paleontologists. I would, I would say that it's a famous fossil horse site among famous fossil horse sites throughout North America. And I would think that you all being historians or interested in history that you should be proud of that the, this fossil locality is part of your heritage. So that concludes my presentation. I talked a little bit longer than I had hoped, but we still have a, a few minutes for questions if any of you have any. In the four different horses that you showed at the beginning, you called two of them zebras? Um, let's go back. You mean in the four horses at Optima? Uh, you mean this? No, it was whether you got the zebra there, but there was another horse uh, in the in family of. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. This one. The one in the middle is that. Yeah. A zebra yeah, also. yeah, it's it's not well. It's so it's not it's 
it's sort of a, uh, it's sort of a hybrid. It's called a quagga. And a quagga, it, it obviously has, it looks like a horse, but it also looks like a zebra. Mm -hmm. And that's an animal that is, is basically, essentially, it's an, it's an extinct animal that's lived during modern times. And it was hunted to extinction uh, in the grasslands of South Africa. And there are zebra, uh, there are pelts and skeletons of the quagga, which was declining at the end, after the last ice age, and it was hunted to extinction in South Africa. So it's essentially a part of the modern horse family and has been around in historical times, but it no longer exists, it's extinct. The other, the other animals depicted here, the asses, the zebras, the donkey, the Przewalski's horse and the domesticated horse in the upper left-hand corner are all the kinds of horses that live today in different either domesticated systems or in as wild, wild beasts. Any other questions? Do you know approximately where the excavated these horses at? I mean, from Optimal or? Yeah, so um, we talked about that briefly when I first connected in, in Zoom. The answer is, um, I don't know, but there are there are archival records from the collections at the University of Oklahoma, the American Museum in New York, and the University of California, Berkeley, and likely the Panhandle Plains Museum, where we could actually, there are probably some maps with an X marks the spot of the exact locality of the Optima fossil, the Optima fossil quarries, but I've not done that research because those materials are not online. Otherwise, I would have get, found a map to put into this talk so we could actually answer that question. That 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 information exists. I just don't have it because the you know the excavated the antelope people uh, dwellings not very far from there. There are two different WPA sites at Optima. One is an archaeological site, and one uh -huh. is a paleo site. Very interesting. Yeah. So I don't know anything about the archaeological site, but we've I presume well. I presume it's different and it, they didn't merge because they're of different ages. But yeah, um, you all probably know more about the, well, you certainly know more about the Optima area than I do because I've just driven by it. Uh, but I do not know exactly where that where the fossil localities are. I believe, as I said, that that picture in the lower right may actually be the workers excavating the fossils from the Optima uh, fossil uh, locality. I could be wrong, but but I th I have a hunch that that's probably um, where they were collecting. I also believe that the the workers on the left were actually collecting these large elephant bones from another locality in in West Texas. If I understand right from a previous person, the the site was a horseshoe bend in an ancient river. Yes. Yeah, typically when 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 you have uh, ancient river systems in the Ogallala Formation, and if they bend, what happens is the bones don't don't they can't make the turn in the bend, and they typically become deposited on what are called point bars, sedimentary sedimentary sediments, mucky sediments, on the edge of a curve of the river, and frequently we find point bar deposits that are very very richly fossiliferous within ancient ri ri river systems. All right, and if I mean I can actually st stop sharing my screen and I can see you all better now than I could before because otherwise you're in small little a small little um, thumbnail. So any other final questions before we wrap up tonight? In the back, someone in the back, did you raise your hand? No. Okay. <laughs> we have some some tea at the museum. Yeah. I did not realize they had such a short route. Uh huh. <laughs> so if now I'm going to have to go back and look. Yeah, if you were to take some pictures of the teeth, the fossil teeth in your museum, if you send me pictures, just take just take simple photos, like on your on your phone or something like that, and put a scale bar, a ruler, so I know a sense of scale. I can let you know what they are, and if okay. they're going to be the if they I I think that the dinohippus was of the four of the eighty percent fossils that were horses. 
um, mo the per they, most of them were of Dino hippus. I remember that they were mostly large and that the smaller horses were of the rarer varieties. But if you were to send me a picture, a photograph of, of the horses, I could tell you whether they were Dino hippus. I could tell you which horses they are. And the same thing with some of the foot bones. It depends upon size. That would be wonderful. Sure. We also, yeah, go we ahead. also have representation at the museum of, of both of the rhinoceroses found there. Um, yeah, yeah. One was a pygmy and one was the... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I may have misspoke. The, the elephant was more dominant in some of the other localities. I don't know. Do you have any... Uh, very large bones from Optima Gaiman. I think if you had elephants from there, they were really, really rare. I don't, I didn't remember seeing them in other countries, but they're more common in some of the other localities like in Texas. Okay, so why, why the habitats were slightly different back that time and more conducive to, uh, to supporting uh, giant uh, elephant-like animals called gonfotheres during this time and why they were rarer, if if at all, present at Optima, I don't really know for sure. It was probably something about the ancient ecology that was more conducive to the supporting the, the horses at the time. Probably 10 miles south of the Optima deal, they excavated some elephants out of the Fisco Creek River. Frisco. So those are, those are different. A that that's interesting. That's not surprising because there are fossil elephant-like animals from various localities in Texas and Kansas, and I'm not so sure. Uh, probably Ice Age during the uh, the, the uh, in Oklahoma, but the Frisco group would would likely have preserved uh, ancient elephants. So that makes a lot of sense. Just for some reason, they were either rare or they didn't occur at at Optima. I don't so, remember seeing gonfotheres so much, but we did have a lot of mammoth. Yeah, the mammoth. So that's interesting. The mammoth are much, uh, they're of a different antiquity. Mm -hmm. So the horse, the gonfotheres and the horses and rhinos that I talked about today, tonight are during the Miocene five to six million years ago. The mastodons and the mammoths lived during the ice ages and they lived in uh, in throughout North America after about, about about the past million or a million and a half years. So there was a there was a large time difference between the horses from Optima Gaiman and the time you find mammoths, the Ice Age mammals, the mammoths and the mastodons and the saber tooth tigers and the like. All right. Any other questions? I do have one. Uh, before you leave, uh, I wanted to thank you, but also, do you mind if we put your um, talk on YouTube? That would be, that's fine with me. I, I certainly, I don't mind that at all. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks all for your, thank, thank you for coming out tonight. And like I said, I wish I could have been there in person, and then I would have gone over to see some fossil localities in New Mexico, probably which is, uh, anyway, we spend summers in New Mexico. Um, but nevertheless, I'm, this was fun for me because it brings back memories of when I was a graduate student almost 50 years ago of uh, the, the, fa the, the fabulous fossil localities in Morris Skinner at the American Museum. So it allowed me to reflect on the early stage of my career. So thank you very much for inviting me to give this presentation. And I thoroughly enjoyed doing the research for the slide presentation. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So with that, I'm going to sign off, and you're welcome. You're welcome to get back in touch with me if if that makes sense. Send me photographs or whatever, and I'd be happy to look at them. All right. Thank you. Bye, bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.